Central Virginia, uh, as well as 800,000 students nationwide at over a billion dollars in funding annually. And our services range from everything from the academic support to the emotional, social, cultural support to ensure the students have not just the financial aid, but the non-financial aid to succeed. Thank you. I'll take it from there. Um, thanks, Susan, and thank you to ASAE and VSAE, uh, the Virginia Society of Association Executives, for the opp opportunity to join this panel of esteemed leaders, and especially Senator Kane, of course. I'm now in my third decade of uh, recovery from acute hyperpartisanship. Um, you know, we live by guiding principles in our personal lives, uh, but it's become painfully obvious that. Uh, the nation is experiencing a deficit in some critically important social principles. The power of ideas, uh, collaboration, discourse, civility, uh, diversity, inclusion, all are essential for a healthy society. Um, as a young man, you might say that I was part of the problem. Uh, I'm hoping to finish my career as part of the solution. Fortunately, uh, every element of, the, of my participation in this event gives voice to these principles. In working with community bankers in Montana and now Virginia, I've seen the way that community bankers and the work they do with employers and employees draw support from both sides of the aisle. This can be seen most recently in the adoption of set-asides created for smaller banks and second round funding for the Paycheck Protection Program. Our members have provided an historic level of lending to small businesses across the nation, and small banks have made two of every three PPP loans. We also saw bipartisan support in the passage of S2155 back in the spring of 2018, which included some significant regulatory relief for community banks, and on which our honored guest this afternoon, Senator Kane, was a primary co-sponsor. And then through engagement with ASAE and VSAE, connecting and learning, I've greatly benefited from timely and valuable training on these core social values. And I've developed a range of relationships that inspire and challenge me to be a better leader. Tying it all together, anyone who shared even five minutes of conversation with Senator Kane knows that he represents the best of these principles. A constituent meeting with Senator Kane is a thoroughly engaging conversation. He's thoughtful, curious, and wise. So again, I appreciate this opportunity and I'm looking forward to the conversation that follows. Thank you so much, Steve. We really appreciate it. Chris, how about you? Great, thank you, Susan. And good afternoon, everyone. It's great to be here with my esteemed colleagues for the event today featuring Senator Tim Kaine, who has been such a great champion for the state of Virginia. Headquartered in Old Town, Alexandria, NAMA, the National Affordable Housing Management Association, represents property managers, owners, and developers of apartment buildings that participate in government programs to keep the rents affordable. Programs offered by HUD, the Rural Housing Service, and an IRS tax credit program. We represent 75% of the multifamily affordable housing industry based on an annual survey, and our members are both for-profit and non-profit entities. In addition to our national office in Old Town, we have 18 regional affiliated organizations across the country. NAMA members provide safe quality homes to some 8 million low to, to moderate income Americans. In particular, lately, we have been providing safe quality homes for staying safely at home during the pandemic. NAMA is committed to the public-private partnership to advance the preservation and development of quality affordable housing and to the professional training of its practitioners from the fundamental concepts such as fair housing to complex regulatory requirements of the federal housing programs. One of the ways we focus on safe quality affordable housing is through our national communities of quality program, which benchmarks success in superior management of affordable rental housing for replicating across the country. Our communities of quality program won an award from ASAE, a silver power of A award in 2012. The power of A awards are a component of ASAE's power of A campaign which was created to highlight the many positive social and economic impacts of associations, from creating industry standards of quality and safety, to providing disaster relief, to offering expertise that creates better policy, and so much more. It's just one of the many exemplary programs offered by ASAE. Thank you again uh, for the opportunity to participate in today's event. Thank you, Chris. Thank you to all of our panelists. Uh, Senator Kane, it's just such an honor to have you join us today. Um, you're surrounded by Virginians. I may work in DC, but I live in Mount Vernon, so you've got a very happy home here on our, our Zoom screen. 
and our entire community is so excited to hear your remarks and then to follow that by having the opportunity to ask you some questions. So I'm going to give the floor to you, Senator Kane, and thank you again for joining us. Well, absolutely, Susan. And, and you know, my only regret is I wish we were doing this in person. This is your yeah. week on the Hill. And if we could be sitting up in my conference room, you know, that would be better. But I'll look forward to the opportunity uh, to do that again and do it in person when we safely can. It, it's been a most most unusual last uh, few months. I mean, I, I sent my staff home uh, to begin telecommuting on March the 12th. And um, if you had told me on that day, and actually there was a trial run, I was having him do it for two days to see if it would work if we needed to. I didn't know that they wouldn't be back yet. They're gonna come back um, in person in phases right after the 4th of July recess. But if you had told me on that day that between March 12 and today, that my wife and I would both have had coronavirus. Two of our three adult children would have lost their jobs because their job businesses are closed, their places of employment are closed. And I, we, and Ann and I know four people who died of coronavirus. If you had told me that on the 12th of March, I would have said, you just, that cannot be the case because I have a nice job and I have health care and I have a fantastic safety net and I have a house where I can go with my wife and if we have to isolate we're not stepping on each other's toes we can you know separate in different parts of the house and pleasantly get our work done but that's actually what the last three months has been and it's really made me think and that's what I first wanted to say to all of you that my wife and I have the resources and the safety net to deal with it. and thank goodness our cases of coronavirus were mild mine was a little unusual hers was standard but they were both mild but, you know, so many people are dealing with this challenging moment in time without the resources that we have. They're dealing with their own health anxieties and anxieties about those around them that are unhealthy. And it doesn't even, even have to be about coronavirus. An awful lot of people haven't been able to see their children or grandchildren or visit their parents or grandparents in nursing homes for three months. And that's a big deal. So you've got the health anxiety. You have the economic anxiety, the number of people who've lost their jobs. Um, neither the health challenges or the economic challenges fall equally on everybody. Disproportionately, those dying and those getting coronavirus are African American and Latino, those losing their jobs are minorities, women and young people, almost all at the lower end of the economic ladder. Um, and now we're dealing with these challenges in communities across the country that because of a, a brutal video that is impossible to ignore, we can no longer pretend that all is well in our criminal justice system and all is well in the relationship between our majority and minority communities, between law enforcement and the communities they serve. And all of these things happening at once just make it a moment that is um, unlike any in my 62 years. So the first thing I'll just say is to each of you on this Zoom call, you have your own anxieties. I don't know what they are, but I know you have them because I know you know somebody who's sick or you know somebody who's lost their job or you're, you know somebody who is worried about the state of the country. And so uh, we need to figure out ways to pull together. Um, and we're in a campaign season that it's sort of the opposite of pulling together, right? I mean, during a presidential campaign, that's, that's not the primary goal. So we, we've got some choppy waters ahead of us still. Um, in Congress, what we've tried to do, and I know that I imagine you'll want to chat a lot about, okay, well, what are we going to do? In Congress, we did take action, bipartisan action, in March and April, four big bills, trillions of dollars, dramatically larger than the st um, stimulus in the aftermath of the fiscal collapse in 2008-2009, and um, it wasn't as if those were easy negotiations, but we got to places where they were bipartisan. House, Senate, Democrat, Republican, Congress, White House, we got there. Um, and the, the way I look at that, and you all are working in your own sphere with your organizations on that, is we tried to basically deal with the health and economic emergency by investing in five pillars. Aid to individuals and families, um, grants to small businesses, the PPP program, loans to larger businesses, aid to hospitals, nursing homes, healthcare institutions, testing, and then aid to st state and local governments. And those were sort of the five pillars. By the end of April, 
the small business well had run dry and a lot of the healthcare funding had run dry and we had to refill them. We're now here working on a number of things, criminal justice reform, the annual defense bill, which is something that I'm very active on as an armed services member, but we're also looking at what would the next bill be, the next significant investment be to deal with the economic and healthcare crisis. And um, this one will be the hardest. The first four were challenging, but we got to bipartisan resolve and we got there fairly quickly. This one is gonna be the toughest one because there's differences between Democrats and Republicans on both the sense of urgency. Do we need to do it now? Do we need to do it now? Or do we need to kind of see how the first four bills sort of filter through and work before we do it? Um, and there are some differences in terms of what should be included that you would expect. Obviously there's gonna be differences in that. The Democratic House passed the HEROES Act in late May. My hope had been that the Senate would act on a bill, not just pick up their bill, but would act on an A bill that we could conference and get to the president before the 4th of July recess. Um, my hopes have dimmed a little bit in that. I thought at the beginning of this five week work period that we would get to something that could get to the president by the 4th of July recess. But I will say much of the White House, not all, but definitely the dominant theme of the GOP majority in the Senate is we don't need to do that before 4th of July. We can, we can tackle it in July instead when we come back from the recess. So that's, that's a challenge. M my belief is what we need to do, the, the core of what we need to do, although there's many things we need to do, and I'm hoping I get some good advice from y'all, is having refilled the, the small business and the hospital healthcare bucket we kind of have to refill the aid to individuals and families and state and local government aid bucket. Um, and there is some general agreement about ways to do that. I, I actually think we will get a bill and we'll resolve the differences about what should be in it. Um, it's obvious that Republicans might want different things than Democrats, that's not unusual. And we could work that out. I think right now the thing that's the harder thing to work out is dramatically different senses of urgency about when we need we can negotiate what is in it ultimately. I'm confident of that. But when we need to do it is the, is the more sizable difference of opinion right now. And as we're doing that, we're also hopefully gonna work on criminal justice reform. Good news is there's a Democratic proposal and as of today, there's a Republican proposal. It's not as if one side says we need to do this and the other side doesn't. If both sides believe there's a need to do something, that's a good starting place. I see things in the Republican bill that I like. I also see things that I don't like or I don't think are sufficient that parts of our bill would be better if we could have a normal markup in the Judiciary Committee and consider both bills and have a vote and get it on the floor and then have amendments to vote. We can do this and we can do it in a bipartisan way. And that's what I hope we'll do. You all play a very important role. You know, I've worked in, in local government and state government now at the federal level and I work with you know, all of our associations, whether Steve mentioned the community banks or whether it's our, you know, medical societies or whether it's other professional organizations, I always enjoy uh, speaking, listening, um, getting your advice. And I'm, I'm looking forward to that today because even though my staff is really good and, you know, we, we think we know what's going on, we often don't know as much about what's going on right on the ground and and you know, the management of affordable housing communities. You know, I, I know a little bit about housing. I've worked on it over the years, but I don't know what the current issues are that Chris and her association are dealing with. And I don't know the, you know, educational challenges. All the, I'm on the education committee, Kimberly, but I don't know all the educational challenges that your students, your 800,000 across the country are, are, are dealing with. And so that's why working with associations is helpful. It gives us the data that we need, the human stories that we need to be better legislators. And, and I'm just happy, Susan, that you asked me to be on. And, and I'm really happy to just get in dialogue and answer your questions or take your advice. Thank you so much, Senator Kane. We're eager to ask questions. Um, what I represent are associations overall. And I, I want to go back to something you said about urgency. Um, first of all, I want to thank you so much for your leadership. Um, in an effort to include 501c6 associations in the Paycheck Protection Program, uh, the letter that you sent to congressional leadership with Senator Warner is much appreciated to expand the program. But let me tell you the realities right now is associations just like small businesses are really on the edge of 
their sustainability being in question. Our main revenue streams, you know, you started out by talking, I wish we could meet live. Well, that's what associations do with major conferences and meetings. And so I, I think it would come as no surprise to you that our, our revenue is extremely compromised. And yet, you know, we have a constituency and missions to fulfill and, and we're doing that to the best of our ability. So expanding that program to, um, to include 501c6 organizations or associations overall is, is really life and death for many of them. So my question for you is, I, I know you talked about the when of it, is it before the 4th of July or afterwards an urgency, but we feel a real sense of urgency. So do you see Congress addressing the PPP in the next big relief package? And um, do you also see them including a reauthorization of the program beyond the June 30th um, deadline that, that's currently in place? So, um, and you know, we've just done a, a, a PPP technical fix bill, making some changes in the, um, essentially the criteria that enable the PPP loans to be converted to grants. And I think we still want to act to get it right. And I, I think part of getting it right is uh, including C6s. Um, when the PPP program was originally put together, it didn't include any of the 501 C3s. Right. So, we realized sort of late in the game, oh gosh, we gotta put 501c3s in. We knew we didn't wanna put 501c4s in, political organizations, you know, campaign accounts, things like that. But we, mis but I just think it was really in the rush of trying to do that CARES Act bill, while we were socially distant, not in the same room, trying to put it together. We put in C3s, that was good. We realized we didn't want C4s, but we didn't think, about C6s, which are more like C3s than they are like C4s. So, thank yeah, you for that. Yeah, it was a, that was an oversight. And we did try to, add, there, there were a number of us who tried to, at the very end, say, wait a minute, C6s ought to be included too, but we were not able to make it happen. I, I think there's a good chance, I wouldn't say it's an 80 or 90 percent or though. I mean, I would say it's more like a 60 to 70 percent or that we could get C6s added in. Um, but look, the, the, the whole PPP program was designed to help people avoid layoffs. You know, we, we, we are giving out funds to Catholic churches, you know, um, and, and homeless shelters and cultural organizations, as well as small businesses. 100,000 Virginia businesses and nonprofits have gotten PPP grant loans totaling $12 billion. We did it so that you wouldn't have to lay people off. I, I don't understand why we want 501c6s to lay people off. If, if the goal of PPP was to avoid layoffs, then you should be included. So my hope is uh, that, that we will find uh, an accord that will make that adjustment and maybe also extend the program. Um, but I think if I had to tell you now, Susan, my gut is the timing is July. I, I would have been nearly certain when we came back after Memorial Day that the Senate would have had a bill kind of negotiated with the White House and the House over to the President by the time we left for July 4th. Um, you know, and, and I wouldn't have said the negotiation would be easy, but I just felt like in five weeks we would get there. Um, I just am, am struck though, the, the urgency language is very different between the Democrats and the Republicans. Now every once in a while the White House will say something <clears throat> that'll sound more like the Democrats talking point on, we need to do something soon, whether it's, you know, something on individuals or th they'll use some urgency language, but that's not uh, uniform or consistent. Sometimes their language is a little more like, hey, the unemployment numbers weren't near so bad. Maybe this is working. Maybe we need to wait and see what happens before we do more. So I, th I think the, the I, I believe we will do another bill. We're going to do another bill, but I think the odds are more likely that it, it would be a July bill now than a June bill. Just one quick follow-up before I um, hand it over to Kimberly for her question. So the difference between 80 to 90 percent and 60 to 70 percent is is urgency or is there something else that might account for that gap? I think it's um, the, the other the urgency is one in, in terms of getting C6s added in. Yeah that's what I meant. And the other is um, the, just the crush of competing demands and which are the ones that are, are most grabbing people's attention. You know, with Chris on, we're reading a lot of information about, you know, is there a, a, for, 
a, a tsunami of evictions coming. If I talk to food banks around Virginia, they are like, you know, we're going to have a major hunger crisis hitting us that will demand uh, increase in SNAP benefits, for example. So I think the 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 reason that I think the C6 ad is a 60 to 70 percenter, but not an 80 to 90 percenter, is a little bit this urgency issue, but it's it's also a little bit more the crush of demands right now and sorting through all of them and probably not being able to meet all of them. And, um, and there are some like, you know, hunger and eviction and foreclosure um, yeah. that are kind of, you know, like that are right at top of mind. Or on the other side, the Republicans are interested in, liabi in liability protection, which is not an a completely unreasonable topic. I mean, we often have liability protection in health emergencies. Vaccine makers get liability protection from the federal level. So it's it's not unprecedented that in a public health emergency that you would do some kind of a reasonable liability protection. So the demands that are on the table already for this next bill are, you know, it's a big stack of them. Um, and, I, and I'm not sure I would say to anybody saying, hey, is, is our priority going to be in the next bill? I'm not sure I'd give higher than 60 to 70 percent to anybody because of the size of the demand list. Thank you, Senator. The needs are many, and I really appreciate your honesty. Kim, I know you have a question. Sure. Uh, thanks, Susan, and thank you, Senator, uh, for your remarks, particularly uh, your, your sharing at the beginning about how the coronavirus has impacted you, your family, and your extended circle. Um, really appreciate that honesty. Um, Again, talking about the ongoing negotiations for the next package, what are your priorities um, as you look to the next package? What would you like to see included specifically to help Virginia-based associations and small organizations to in the recovery? Um, I think the, the we've talked about C6. I think that would be very important. Um, my priorities are, are really, and they, they have to do a little bit, I guess, with the roles that I play in the Senate. Um, again, having refilled the bucket for the PPP program and some of the hospital and healthcare aid, I think we need to do more at the state and local government level. Um, nearly a million state and local government employees, mostly local government employees, lost their jobs in April when you got the month in job reports. Because what happened was when we got the state and local government aid in March, the only way the Democrats could succeed in our effort to get that added to the package was to agree to a restriction that the money would not be used to backstop lost revenue. It could only be used for excess expenses. So there are many excess expenses if a local or state government is having to buy PPE, um, you know, or, or have healthcare workers do overtime or the workers at the Unemployment Commission who are processing UI applications do overtime. Those are extra expenses. But what, what's really hitting governments now is lost revenues. You know, in real time, I know as a mayor and governor, you see sales tax, lodging tax, meals tax, business license tax, and some other taxes start to go down in real time. You have to then, every uh, 46 states, including Virginia, do budgets that are July 1 to June 30. Everybody's doing their budget right now. They're all having to ratchet down their budgets for the next year. And the only way to deal with dramatically reduced budgets is usually in the layoff space. So if they can't use money to backstop lost revenues, it's, it's, job, it's uh, uh, job freezes and furloughs and even layoffs. And we're seeing that happen everywhere. There's never a good time to lay off uh, state and local government employees, but during a global health pandemic is the worst time because the majority of first responders in this country work for state and local governments. Um, I mean, imagine dealing with you know, law enforcement challenges like protests in the country already exacerbated by the anxieties that people feel because of the health and economic challenges and having to lay off first responders at the same time. I mean, you just, you know, it's just a perfect storm. So I think um, more state and local government aid and, and, and maybe even retroactively to the aid that we did in March, allowing some of those dollars to be used to backstop lost revenues in addition to deal with excess expenses, that's priority one. Priority two is these individual needs. The way we dealt with the individual needs in the CARES Act, and I think it was smart to do it, we're trying to do something quick, trying to get dollars out quick, trying to help people quick, payment to individuals and families, an enhanced unemployment insurance benefit that was enhanced in three ways, 
the universe that could apply, the length of weeks you could get it, and the amount of the benefit every week. We enhanced it in three different ways. Um, <clears throat> I think that enhanced benefit, the extra $600 over what your payment would be, starts to be a disincentive in terms of some businesses bringing folks back to work. Um, so what I would do, because, because look, if you're going to get your UI benefit plus $600, which is an additional $15 an hour for 40 weeks, that's going to be more than your salary in a number of occupations, <clears throat> in a number of jobs. And so we basically are disincentivizing the return to work. At the same time, we've told businesses getting PPP loans, the way you convert your loan to a grant is you reassemble your payroll. Well, we don't want all these small businesses to have to just have all this extra debt on their balance sheets. We want them to be able to convert to a grant, but if, if there's a disincentive for their employees to come back, uh, I think we hurt the employees and we hurt the business. So what I would like to do with the individual aid is start to convert it more toward targeted, do you need assistance? Do you need rental assistance? Do you need you know, mortgage assistance? Do you need food assistance? Do you need healthcare assistance? We can provide direct aid to people that would give them assistance in a tough time that provides no disincentive to going back to work. And so I, I, would, I would probably start to reformat the individual aid around um, you know, these particular necessities of life, um, but not provide people this enhanced benefit. Maybe you scale down the enhanced benefit. You don't have to drop it like a cliff on July 31, but you, you probably need to scale it down so that we are encouraging people to go back to work as work is safely opening, but still providing them with some resources that they, they can use in the challenging time to meet the necessities of life. Yeah, I would be remiss if I didn't um, comment that in, definitely in, in uh, pushing out uh, CARES Act funds, um, our programs work directly with students, families, and adults. We work with adult learners and yeah. in advocating to get uh, money's put into TRIO for recovery purposes. Um, we were told, oh, well, we gave money directly to the institutions. Well, at a lot of our institutions, because there was so much discretion, in some cases, our students who are the neediest were shut out because right. the determination was made, oh, well, you got your full need met in your financial aid. Mm -hmm. So um, so there's definitely, there. I, I'm with you, Senator, there's ways to get direct uh, need to those who have it. So we can, we can continue to talk more about that. Well, yeah, and, and please, yeah, share that with us because for example, on the educational aid, we may do more. The first, the first round of higher ed aid, the institutional aid, they had, they had to give 50% of it directly to students for expenses related to COVID, but we did allow the institutions some significant discretion in figuring out what that was. The other chunk of the dollars could go to the institutions themselves to figure it out, but there may be more, you know, directed strategies that would be successful and we'd be glad to dialogue about that. Awesome. Thank you so much. Yeah, you back Thank you, Senator. Uh, Steve, I think you had a question. I did. Um, in as much as we can actually move away from COVID for a, a minute, you know, you're yeah. active on so many issues. Tell us about some of your other priorities. Steve, yeah, no, I've got a lot of them, and it's trying to figure out a way to get, you know, bandwidth on the, you know, COVID and criminal justice reform will be so large, but um, I'm on the Armed Services Committee, and, you know, th this is really a powerful one. The one bill that Congress will pass every year is the Armed Services Bill, and um, that bill has much more in it than a lot of Americans think. I mean, I'll give you one example, the Directed Medical Research Program. There's a medical research program within DOD that is heavily funded that is designed to do research into conditions that military members experience disproportionately. But over decades, um, treatments and innovations and breakthroughs have been achieved through that research that have filtered out and have changed the way we treat breast cancer and a whole series of other cases. Because the military has had a disproportionate experience with COVID on uh, carriers like the Roosevelt, we can put money into that and really accelerate some research with DOD funding that then can potentially be a benefit to society. So last week in the Armed Services Committee, we passed the Defense Authorizing Act. You know, it's everything from shipbuilding to military pay raise to how we treat, um, help military spouses get jobs, whole series of things. That bill will likely be up on the floor of the Senate 
either next week or the following week. And the idea is to get that bill in conference uh, and then get it to the White House. And it's a very good bill to my way of thinking for Virginia and for the defense of the nation, sizable priority for me. Um, second, we're, and this would kind of go back into Kim's space, on the Health Education Labor Pension Committee, we've been underway in working on the reauthorization of the Higher Education Act. We only do it about every 10 years. Um, we were making some pretty good headway on that. Um, but the COVID related issues on the committee have delayed it. But, but I do know that my chairman, Senator Alexander, who used to be president of the University of Tennessee and secretary of education for the nation, he wants to get this done before he retires at year end. Um, and we ought to be thinking about the higher ed of the future and, and the workforce needs that we will have. Here's something, Steve, that is, is an insight from coronavirus, but it's about much more than coronavirus. Um, we have crammed 10 years of advancing in telework, telehealth, teleeducation, telecommuting into the last three months. Sessions like this. Um, a physician friend at the University of Virginia said that she did 0% of her patient uh, visits via telehealth in February. She now does 70%. And when I asked her, and what will it be when we're all done with coronavirus? She says, I still think it'll be 70%. I'll always have my first visit with the patient in person, but they have to drive a long way often to get to the hospital. Why wouldn't I do it by telehealth? But then during the visit, they'll tell me something and they'll say, that doesn't sound right. You should come in and then we'll set up an appointment. So 30% will still be in person. But you know, sessions like this or telehealth or a, a George Mason University offering course content online or a K-12 school offering online, it only works if you, if you have broadband. It only works if you have a device, if you can afford a device like this to get the content. So it's, um, I think there's a whole new kind of priority that's opened up about well, what do we do to enable all Americans to have access to some of the upsides of this technology that we've experienced in the last few months. That could potentially get into an infrastructure package or it could be a standalone part even of a, a COVID bill, a better uh, investments in, in uh, broadband for rural parts of the country or for low income people who can't afford devices. So there's a lot you know, that is built up that we gotta do. I need to do. Yeah. That's right. Thank you, Senator. Uh, I'm going to give Chris uh, the next question, please. Chris. Hey, thank you, Susan. And thank you, Senator, for all your insightful comments and particularly your uh, reference to the potential need for rental assistance for unemployed uh, renters um, as a result of COVID-19. Um, so the first six months of, of 2020 have felt like a year or more um, to most of us, I think. And in six short months, we're going to be in December. So in light of COVID and all the things that we have, all the forces that work currently, um, I'm going to ask you to take out your crystal ball and say, uh, where do you think we'll be as a nation uh, in December, uh, economically, politically, um, health-wise? Um, I know it's, it's hard for all of us to see, but, uh, but we would love to, see, to have your insights. That is, no, it's very challenging. And I'll tell you, the, the heart of it, let me, let me combine health and economy because um, they are integrally related. The, the economy is completely related to our experience in dealing with COVID-19. I was governor of Virginia during the fiscal collapse of 2008 and 2009 um, at the end of the Bush presidency and then into the Obama presidency. And so I was very much in the please help us, you know, and I was working and watching revenues decline and all of that. But, but that was an economic challenge driven by economic challenges. It was, it was an economic and fiscal collapse driven by underlying economic conditions and the failure to regulate certain transactions. This is an economic challenge driven by health challenge. The economy was in you know, fairly solid shape. There were weak spots and it wasn't being shared by everybody, but in February, people were pretty bullish on the economy. But it's been the global pandemic and frankly, the poor US response to it that is, that is heard. Um, and what that means is we're not gonna be on an economic uptick until we get our arms around and show we're really managing the, the pandemic um, in a better way. Um, and the problem, Kim, I mean, uh, the problem, Chris, with it is there's still so much about this virus that we don't know. Um, I, I had coronavirus, but I had none of the standard symptoms. I now realize that 
my symptoms are more like the symptoms that children are showing up with in emergency rooms, immune system reactions, not respiratory problems. And so I had symptoms that were completely non-traditional. And so I didn't think it was coronavirus. I thought it was really bad hay fever. It was a horrible pollen season. I thought that was what it was. <clears throat> I now know I have antibodies, but we don't know what the antibodies provide. For those who've had it, we don't know, is it a short-term immunity? Is it long-term immunity? Is it immunity for some or not for others? And the other thing that we're not yet completely sure about is the pace of vaccine development. Now, the vaccine is the one area where I feel bullish because the U.S., we have such great innovators, companies, and research institutions, including the DOD, and there's sort of a healthy competition now where a lot of people are trying to get the first vaccine that will work. And that competition is speeding us toward an end, but I think we're going to see a continued challenges with exposure to coronavirus. Um, I mean, look, we're a nation of 330 million people. Um, we've had about 2 million diagnosed cases of coronavirus, but we've had over 110,000 deaths. The fatality rate's probably about 1%. What would that tell me? That would tell me that we haven't had 2 million cases. We've probably had about 10 million cases. 2 million have tested positive. Many others haven't. I, I never tested positive for coronavirus. I've tested for the antibodies. It's very easy to catch this. So if, as a nation, we've got now between 10 and 11 million people who've had it, there's going to be many, many more people who are going to get this. It's just so easy to catch. Now we're using masks, we're socially distancing. That will slow it down, but many more people are going to get it. So I think the until we get a vaccine that is capable of a large-scale distribution, we're going to continue to see more and more cases, hopefully not at a big peak because we're wearing masks and socially distancing. But, but, but to socially distance and do the things we need to, that will slow the economic recovery. Um, politically, it's very difficult to predict. I mean, if, if you just said Vegas odds today, Vegas odds today, I would say that Democrats will control both houses and the White House. Um, and that's just based on my reading of polling and also in a time of economic challenge and a big health challenge, that tends to be held more against the incumbent party. Whoever's in power is gonna bear more responsibility of that. And people are gonna say, well, let's try something new. So without going too much into that, I think that would be the, the Vegas odds today. But I'll tell you this, however it's set up, whoever's in the White House and whoever's in Congress, there's gonna be tremendous need for sort of political social healing of the kind that Steve talked about in his, open, in his opening comments once the campaign is over. Maybe, maybe more so than just about any election aftermath, you know, in the history, or at least in the time that I've been alive. Absolutely, oh. thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you, Senator Kane. I should have said, and, and I sincerely mean, we're so grateful that you and your family have recovered. Uh, that's, that's quite a story and, and, you know, right under your nose. So we're glad that you're with us and able to um, operate it. It's, it it's a scary scenario that you lay out, Senator Kane. I want and you to I, know that we- the, the thing that was the most scary, you know, it ended up our cases were mild, but here's what was scary about this. And this is why, please, please be careful. Um, I probably got infected when we were working on the CARES Act in Capitol Hill at the end of March, maybe around St. Patrick's Day. Now, for, fortunately, we had sent my staff home a week before. So I was in the office basically without staff. I started to get symptoms around March 23rd. Mm. Then I gave it to my wife and she got it around April 1st. But between the time I got infected and April 1st, I didn't know I had coronavirus. Even when I got symptoms, I thought it was hay fever. I was supposed to give blood at a big blood drive at the Jewish Community Center. I was supposed to go see my wife's parents at a nursing home. I was supposed to go visit my own parents in Kansas City. I was supposed to go to a big wedding down in Appalachia in Radford during that time period. I didn't do any of those things, not because of me. I would have done them. I've had hay fever before and I do everything when I have hay fever. But society was wisely shutting things down. And as a result, I could infect my wife, but I wasn't infecting everybody at the Jewish Community Center or everybody at the nursing home. So that to me was the scary part of it, how close I, I came 
to dangerously being around others because I thought I had something else. So the, the message from that is you might have it and not know it. Right. Because right. I had it and didn't know it. And so the need to be careful and then to continue to be careful is that that is my big, you know, my lecture. Please be careful. I think we're all heeding it, you know, the association community and thinking of, of coming back and, and coming back to live events when we can or hybrid events. Um, we're very mindful of the requirements of doing that. It's a big challenge and the risk is huge, as you point out. I just want to let you know that there's a chat and a lot of um, questions and answers coming up. So I'm going to turn to a couple of comments and questions from right. our participants if you have a moment. Uh, sure. First, I want to let you know that you are being thanked for your uh, support of the association community uh, in several of our comments. Uh, one actually calls out your leadership on the Great American Outdoors Act and also UBIT, and we collectively thank you for that very much. Um, kind of a, a summary question for you. you. You talked about C4s and then C6s, and sometimes associations can be miscast as only lobbying organizations, as you know very well. So um, what are your thoughts about how associations can have a bigger and much more credible voice in the legislative process. Um, you know, is anybody doing it especially well? How can we cut through the clutter and let people know that we're mission-driven, uh, benefits to society and the world, and all of those good things about associations? What, what advice would you give us, Senator? Yeah, so I, I think um, people don't necessarily understand that C6s are composed of all these members, you know, so so many you, you all have, you know, C6s have members. And, and then you're the repository of the collective wisdom of your members. So you're, you're serving your members. Um, you know, my local chamber of commerce provides all kinds of services for rich businesses. So there's a service component, but then there's also a, you know, you could talk to every community bank in Virginia, but if you get Steve on the phone, and a couple of members of his, of his board, they're gonna have, you know, kind of crunched all of the input down to, and here are the really important things for you to know. So I, I think um, you, you portray, the way to portray yourself as C6s is, is we work with membership um, that are in all of your communities, all these members, and we hear what they have to say, and we can be an expertise basis for you. We can communicate to you what we are hearing and that's how I've always really valued my interaction with my association statewide. I look, I try to get out around the state a lot and visit with individual businesses. And you know, I do work with folks in the in the affordable housing community in Virginia who are doing LITC projects through the VHDA. But <clears throat> I like hearing from an individual business, but I really like hearing from a statewide association that can kind of summarize and give me priorities. And I think that has high credibility. So I think service to your members who are in all of our communities and we're a repository of, you know, the expertise and the ideas that can enable you to do a better job. I think, I think that's your, your value add for offices like ours. Thank you. That's good advice to us. And, and I guess the reason it's, it's so on the surface for us is, is everything that you've said about urgency and the competition for these dollars to provide relief to associations, but also in the longer term, you know, thinking more broadly, to make sure that associations have a voice in the legislative process and to, to add that value that you so well described. So, uh, Senator, do you have time for one more question? Yeah, or? Oh, fantastic. Okay. Um, this one is maybe a little bit of a toughie. Let's see. Uh, sure. What would tar okay? What would targeted assistance look like and how would transparency and equitable equitable distribution be assured if not an enhanced benefit? Yeah, that, that's a really good question. You've got to do it right. I mean, here, um, we're having a hard time, for example, um, transparency is really important. We're having a hard time getting the White House to embrace the transparency provisions of the CARES Act. You might remember when President Trump signed it, the only thing, this big bill, and we, and we worked on it very well, and his secretary Mnuchin was key to this, but the only thing he said he didn't like were the transparency provisions of the of the business loan programs. They would not commit toward um, identifying recipients of loans in, in either the large business, and now we're finding in the PPP programs. So you've got to, I think transparency, hey, it's your dollars, it's public dollars. So transparency on all of it, no matter who it's to, 
should be the public's expectation we should do it how do you do direct aid on the individual side so again i just kind of go back to this this conundrum that i'm thinking about we had a ppp program that went to businesses we didn't ask them to show they lost revenue we didn't ask them to show us they were well run they just had to show us what their payroll was and they could get a loan but it converts to a grant only if they can reassemble their payroll it was an anti-layoff loan so we want these businesses to reassemble their payroll or at least as much as they can okay but on the other hand we give to individuals an unemployment insurance benefit now as i say we did three things we expanded the universe. Only about 30% of American workers qualify for unemployment insurance. So we expanded to include self-employed, independent contractor, gig worker, multiple part-time. That was good. We extended the, the traditional 13 week benefit period because we knew this was tougher than that and we needed to go longer. But then we added that $600. And the reason that was done was because it was too hard to figure out Every state system is different. Every state's maximum payment is different. So we just said, just take what you get at the state and you get $600 more a week. And it was okay in March to give people a little bit of an incentive not to go to work when the epidemic was running rampant, the virus was running rampant. That was okay, that was to promote safety. However, you get to Ju July 31, people, you know, if they're getting the extra 600 a week on top of their UI benefit, that could be easily more than they were making at their job. So now we've given them right. a distance to go back. And the company that got the PPP loan, wait, I want it to be a grant, not a loan, but I got to get people back to work to do it. So I think if, if we could start to move to this direct model where um, maybe it's not the enhanced UI benefit, maybe we maintain the broader universe, maybe we maintain more weeks eligibility for UI, but instead of the enhanced benefit, we take those dollars and put them into, you know, for folks who are have a demonstrated need, maybe on the income level, uh, they're facing eviction or foreclosure or uh, food aid. I think what you do there is you increase SNAP benefits. That would likely be the quickest way to do it, easiest to distribute. Uh, that way you can provide directed aid, educational assistance. You could provide directed aid, but that would have no possible disincentive to go back to work. You could get that aid and then go back to work and earn your salary at work and that would that would be better. So that may be the way to do it. But I do agree with the questioner that I think transparency is, is what everybody should expect. If, if Congress is saying we're going to spend this money, then you should be able, and we too, to see if it's done well, because we'll want to learn from it and do it better next time if we need to. Transparency. I think that covers it very well. Thank, thank you, Senator. I have one last question for you. I think you'll enjoy um, answering and we'll enjoy hearing your answer. Mm -hmm. Question is, how can we prioritize job readiness for certain groups like veterans as we're planning for post-COVID-19? I think that's a yeah, very important question. Um, the, uh, on the Armed Services Committee, my two little like subspecialties are veterans unemployment, which largely involves making sure people are equipped today when they're active so that the transition to veteran is better. And I'm actually a proud dad today. My son, today is his retirement day from active duty service as a Marine. Uh, wow. today, and he, he is, today is the day he transitions from active to reserve. And he's had a wonderful career in the Marine Corps and I'm really, really proud of him. But you want, if you wanna deal with veterans on employment, you really have to start when people, you know, are active and get them ready. But the other issue is military spouses. And I'll tell you something, um, military spouses have tremendous talents and skills, but they often don't put them to highest and best use because they move at odd times and yeah. their credentials from one state don't go to the next. So we're trying to work that out. So I'll tell you, as an association of associations, if you want to do anything in the veterans unemployment or military spouse unemployment, um, I would be very glad to connect you with organizations like Blue Star Families and others that have been we can do some good policy at the federal level, but the, the key then is, you know, kind of the handoff and the, the, uh, an employer community that wants to do it, makes it a value, but knows where to go to find good people who can meet your needs. And I would be glad to facilitate that. Well, I think with the, the folks on the phone who are listening to your remarks and the questions that you've had, 
I think there will be those who will take you up on that offer, including us. So Senator Kane, I wanna thank you so much for your time today. We're just at the end of, of an hour and thank you for staying an entire hour with us. We know how busy you are, especially with all the committees you serve on. We like committees too as associations. We have lots of them. Yeah. So um, you know, you've been an inspiration and insight to us. We're ever hopeful that there will be some relief for associations, but we're just so encouraged to know how much you believe in the missions of associations and the true work that we do and contributions we make. So it's a pleasure to work with you and your staff and others who, um, who believe the same. So thank you so much for your time and you have a great day and good luck. We're right behind you with everything that you, um, you described to us today, certainly on the right track. All right, Susan, I'm leaving now to go to a classified hearing on, on nuclear arms negotiations. So that's like a massive a mental channel change that is, uh, that's, that's, a, well, good luck. We're all going to be wishing you well on that and right. uh, make the transition well. Thank you, Senator. Bye-bye. Okay, bye-bye.